Well, thank you so much for coming out on Monday morning. I sure appreciate it. Derek informed me that I was brash and bold and I could introduce myself. So um, I'm Angie Matke. I'm a physician of emergency medicine. Um, I am a practicing physician. Uh, I actually am a traveler. I live here in Atlanta and I work uh, other places in the country. Um, <clears throat> um, as a note, my slides are not up there. Mark. Okay. Um, I ha uh, am obliged to offer uh, my conflict of interest statement. I am a tool of the medical industrial complex. Okay, so I have a certain bias that is going to be present in all of my slides implicitly. I'm board certified in emergency medicine and still in practice. I'm also human though, so any mistakes that I made are mine. And uh, any images that are in this presentation, I have stolen shamelessly for educational purposes. And I'm a doctor, but I'm not your doctor. If you have any specific medical uh, questions, uh, I would encourage, I can answer general questions, but in general, you're gonna have to refer to your own physician, or rather in specific, you'll have to refer to your own physician. This is not medical advice, so. Well, you know, we all, there, there are so many medical myths that get propagated. You know, grandma says, go outside and it's and you're in the cold and you'll get a cold. Well, we're going to talk about those. Um, uh, this is an, an incomplete list, right? There are hundreds of these. I hear them every day. I hear them uh, in my practice. So um, let's start with some of them. So Mark Twain said, it's easier to fool people than to convince them that they have been fooled. You've seen this, right? Um, so does being cold cause colds? No. 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 Absolutely not. Um, they're caused by viruses. And um, they do seem more common in winter because we're all cooped up in a narrow environment. We don't wash our hands as much as we want to or we're at a convention and people are sneezing and coughing and hugging and kissing and shaking each other's hands and so we all get the con crud, which is a cold. Um, wet hair and feet don't cause colds. Sorry, Grandma. Um, they are probably more uh, transmitted a little more easily in dry conditions. Uh, <clears throat> the um, people who exercise more do seem to get fewer colds, but we're not really sure why this is. Is this a cause? Is this an effect? Or is it completely something completely different? Um, allergies, oddly, may seem to increase your risk of getting a cold. Um, we're not really entirely sure yet. So once you've got a cold, how are you going to treat it? Um, <clears throat> bed rest and fluid, like I would recommend it? Well, you know, the ads would want you to do vitamin C, zinc, things like that. Um, do they cure colds? Probably not. Um, zinc may shorten colds by a few hours, but we're not entirely sure that that's clinically, I don't think that that's really clinically significant. Six hour difference is not a big deal. Um, in fact, intranasal zinc, when you, you know, the, uh, what is it called, the Zycam, the spray that they were spraying up in the nose was actually killing the nerve cells in the nose. And many times, it, and it, it killed the sense of smell, and many times that was irreversible. Don't spray stuff up your nose, it's not supposed to be there. Um, vitamin C in large doses may actually increase the cancer risk. We're not entirely in uh, completely sure why, but it seems that there may be an antioxidant effect. You do need to have a certain level of antioxidation to kill off the cancer cells. Um, <clears throat> Mice uh, uh, in um, experiments have shown that there were increased number of skin tumors. Linus Pauling is really mostly responsible for this. Um, he was a huge fan, and of course he had Nobel Prizes, but um, he, and he was a really smart guy, but he was wrong on this point, unfortunately. D who knows the Nobel Prizes that he won? Chemistry, that's one. Peace, excellent, yes, those are his two Nobel Prizes. Who, do anybody can think of any of the other Nobel laureates who had more than one? Yeah. Murray Curie? Curie. Curie. Curie, yep, exactly. And then uh, there, John Bardeen won in physics in 57 and 72, and Frederick Sanger chemistry in 58 and 1980. And I, I only said that because I'm such a geek and I just love that. Uh, uh, Linus Pauling, for all my frustration with him, he actually has one of my favorite quotes. It's, do unto others 20% better than you would expect them to do unto you to correct for subjective error. <laughs> <laughs> so you got your cold, you're not feeling good, you got your teddy bear, and you got a fever. So a fever, <laughs> fever is defined medically as the elevation of the body temperature to a new set point. Um, the normal temperature ranges from about 97.7 or so up to about 99.5, but your mileage may vary. Some people do tend to run a little bit lower. Um, it is a symptom. It's not the disease. Um, this is different from hyperthermia. Now, um, it 
is a, an adaptive response, and uh, it actually links into one of my favorite pieces of medical trivia. Back before we had penicillin, there, oh, I've got to stand back here, Mark, yell at me. Okay, so um, back before we had penicillin, right, that was kind of in the 1930-ish kind of time frame, there was a problem called syphilis. Everyone's heard of syphilis? It is 100% fatal eventually. Sometimes it takes 30 years, but eventually everyone dies of syphilis who gets it. And there was a doctor, Dr. Werner uh, Jaureg or something like that, who discovered that um, the syphilis organ, I think they already knew that the syphilis organism was very sensitive to temperature, but it was his idea to actually treat syphilis with malaria. That, I know, right? Ooh, right? What a great idea. It causes very high fevers. Temperatures go up to 105, 104, 105. And um, that actually does kill the syphilis organism. And he had some pretty good success with this. Now, malaria kills about 5% of patients but who get malaria. But 100% versus 5%. I know which one I'm picking. Plus, we can treat malaria with quinine because we've known for centuries that that worked. So he won the Nobel Prize for this in 1927. Um, fever is an adaptive response. It is part of the immune system function. It revs up the, the white blood cells and, and the cytokines, and it actually makes you lay down because you feel crappy and just heal. And um, it actually it, it, it helps you fight off infection. Um, it is a natural uh, immune response. Um, if you treat fevers, there is some evidence that it may actually prolong illness if you don't let the fever run. Now, you do run the risk of dehydration with the fever, so you want to make sure you drink plenty of fluids. It increases the body's fluid requirements. Um, it is harder to run a fever as we get older. And very young children, if they have high fevers like less than about three months old, that's very ominous and you need to get them to a doctor immediately. Uh, cool baths, which have been used for um, since I can't even remember when, actually don't help with fever. They uh, cool the, t the skin temperature, but does nothing about the set point. So once you've induced shivering, that actually can cause the fever itself to go up. Oh, right? <laughs> so... So these recommendations about fever are applicable to healthy um, adult range people, but extremes of age and extremes of illness, those people have a separate set of rules, and that's something you'll have to speak with your doctor about. Um, if you have a rash with the fever, if you're bruising with the fever, you need to see a doctor right away. Do not wait. Uh, can't breathe. I gotta just put this in because I'm a doctor. If you can't pee, can't breathe, you can't um, think. If you're turning blue, go call 911 immediately. <laughs> okay. All right. So where am I? Oh yes. So um, one of the problems we're now facing. Uh, is that there are lots of people who are not vaccinating anymore. I, one of the places I work is in Ohio. We're having outbreaks of measles. We're having outbreaks of mumps. Really? Are you kidding me? I have to freaking learn mumps again? Jesus. Okay, so anyway, this, who can, I mean, who can be surprised? People aren't vaccinating their kids. This is the image that is going out. This is what people are seeing. So they're not getting their updates. Um, and in fairness, some of the Amish community who, was not, who were not getting vaccinated for measles and such saw what the devastation that it causes. They're getting vaccinated now because they understand how important it is. So I'm actually quite proud of them for making that change in their, in their daily um, um, medical care. Um, so, do vaccines cause autism altogether? Yeah. No! Absolutely not does not cause autism. There have been robust studies. No, 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 nine in every language. It does not cause autism. I am actually furious with Andrew Wakefield. I take it personally when doctors do horrible things. The studies that he showed that uh, where he claimed that the uh, measles, mumps, um, rubella vaccine was linked to autism were ethically horrible. They were very small. They were not independently verified. And in fact, the Lancet, <coughs> excuse me, the Lancet retracted that article and he was vilified, thank goodness, among medical circles. Although I understand like the, the thing he's popping up again. Ugh, don't get me started. Okay, so um, are they safe? Generally, yes, they are safe. There are some exceptions. There are um, some people who are allergic to eggs that cannot have them. Oh, thank you. Um, there are some people who are allergic to eggs that cannot have the vaccines. 
I should have waited till a joke so I could actually take a sip. Um, <laughs> um, there are some allergies. If there are true allergies or if, if someone is immune compromised, there are some vaccines they can't have. Um, you don't want to be given a live vaccine to somebody who has an immune compromised state. If there's a member of the family, some of the um, vaccines, especially the oral vaccines, can revert to wild type and actually cause infection. So that's why you have to be careful about who you give them to. Um, but killed vaccine is usually still safe in those people. Do you need to boost your immune immunity? Well, the immune system is very complex, and this is a very simplistic question, because I know you're seeing this on the television and on, on uh, you know, the packages and everything. Um, this is a really vague claim, and it, it doesn't really have any basis in, in reality. Um, it's a, and it's a false analogy. Um, an overactive immune system actually causes problems. Asthma, eczema, uh, you can get cytokine storms that cause the flu deaths, where the whole body just completely take uh, the uh, immune system just kind of takes off and you get um, uh, sepsis, and it's, it's just not a good thing. Um, you can also have misdirected immune system when you have a boosted immune system. This can cause arthritis, MS, diabetes, things like that. And also, the inflammatory response is prothrombotic, and that means that it can increase your risk of causing clots. And clot, blood clots, especially in a blood vessel, like one of the veins of the legs that then travels up to the lungs, can cause instant death. Bad, right? Death is mostly bad, right? Especially what? Instant death, yes. Just add water. <laughs> you don't want to wake up dead one day, right? Um, but the cytokine, <laughs> the cytokine storm caused SIRS, SIRS you heard about, ARDS, and um, the uh, prothrombotic event, the blood clots, it can cause heart attacks, strokes. It's just bad all over. Um, let's see here. Uh, Oh, uh, the uh, runaway immune system, uh, the cytokine storm that I mentioned before, which causes the, the um, um, symptoms of, uh, of uh, um, sepsis, um, it's responsible for causing the deaths in severe flu pandemics um, and was the cause of um, near fatalities in a 2006 drug trial, apparently. So you have to be careful about these cytokines. They're good stuff. Um, so I just love this little frog. Isn't he cute? <laughs> Oh, he held this leaf for thirty for th like thirty minutes. He held that leaf. A uh, guy named Pendix Palm took that picture in Java. I just think that's so cool. All right, <laughs> I just like frogs. They're cute. Okay, so um, um, I'm an emergency doctor. We have like I think they said an eight second attention span in general. So less than goldfish, wasn't it? <laughs> it was less than goldfish. So okay. Um, so one of the other myths is that the uh, position during the conception of the fetus determines the sex of the fetus. Hmm, well, is that true? Um, probably not, it's probably not true. Uh, worldwide, there's a 107 to 100 um, um, ratio now because of gender side. And um, it, it kind of, at, at birth, and then eventually kind of settles in around 101 to 100 um, due to genetics defects that will manifest in uh, males that don't manifest in females. Um, <clears throat> But today, we're having a lot of sex-selective abortions, and that has artificially skewed the uh, race, the, the gender ratio. Um, so uh, they're, they're trying to be a more proactive about preventing those kind of sex-selective abortions, and, and um, the number is now coming down. I think the most recent uh, in China, it's down to about a 111 to 100. So um, no, it does not seem to be, and it, and it doesn't predict the care, how you carry the fetus either. I know. Um, um, when I was pregnant, everybody would say, oh, you're having a girl, or oh, you're having a boy because you're carrying the child this way or that way or whatever. Yeah, that's not true. <laughs> that, has to, that has to do with abdominal muscle tone and, and your own physiology, but it doesn't have to do with the gender of the baby, sorry. Uh, okay, let's see here. So what does predict fetal sex? Um, okay, maybe I should have restated that. <laughs> um, there, do I have a picture of that? Yep, so 50-50 male to female sperm, right, the X and Y. Um, more males seem to be conceived, at least in the Shettles report. Um, he decided, they decided that the Y sperm would be faster because the Y chromosome is smaller, the X chromosome is heavier, so it would travel more slowly. Um, that actually doesn't appear to be true and has not been reproduced. Uh, ha, ha pun intended. So, <laughs> okay, so... We got the conception started, but not in this instance. Um, 
So, so the, is that inappropriate? Is that not right? <laughs> Are you offended? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Didn't know there were any spermatozoa in the audience. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, all right, so, so the fetus is cooking, and now we got a baby, and, and the baby grows up, and now they're getting old enough to start to talk and ask for chewing gum. So how long does chewing gum last in the intestines, right? Because they don't know how to chew it and spit it out. They swallow it, right? It doesn't last seven years, right? It can't. Um, the digestible parts are digested in a few hours, and then the rest of it pass through in a day or two. Um, there are rare instances of very large basores, which is the name that we give to the block of a thing somewhere in the, in the um, stomach. Um, they can cause obstruction. Um, habitual swallowers. There was a four-year-old boy and a one-and-a-half-year-old girl were both found to have gum basors, um, but she'd also swallowed a few coins. Um, it's funny, when I, was, when I was making this slide, I actually swallowed my gum by accident, <laughs> and I'm totally fine, so there you go. All right, this is actually a picture of a gum basor. You can see it with the coins there, and um, it was uh, the one-and-a-half-year-old female and um, they went in and they took it out. Um, the symptoms um, from the additives of chewing gum, you can actually have symptoms from that. Some people will get some diarrhea, they'll get some flatulence, meaning it makes them fart. So um, they'll get some, uh, maybe some stomach upset sometimes. Um, and you can have some other reactions to some of the other additives. So now that we're in the intestines, do you have pounds of digested meat in your intestines? No, of course not. The, digest the digestive tract is one way. It doesn't allocate the broccoli to this side and the meat to this side. Okay, broccoli, you come on through, come on through. We're going to hold the meat over here. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. That's not true. Um, if there's no rest stops, this is a one-way trip. It doesn't, it doesn't go back. It doesn't, I mean, well, sometimes it comes back, right? But it's only... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I spoke too soon. All right, so um, <laughs> if the meat really did stay in the intestines, that would be an obstruction. That is a surgical emergency. You would be going to surgery to get that taken out. Um, okay, look away now if you are squeamish. Okay? So he had way too much fiber in his diet. Right? Obviously, he needs detoxification. Right? Oops. Oh, darn it. Okay. Okay, so um, this is the big, the big uh, catch word, right? Detoxify. You want to detoxify the toxins. And like our speaker from earlier said today, it is the vaguest term that there is. Now, we actually do detoxify when people have overdoses of, of um, uh, mer mercury, iron, alcohol. We actually do detoxify people. Those are medical problems. But the detoxification regimens that people are selling you on, you know, uh, late night TV or whatever are rubbish. I mean, it's just it's just ridiculous. They can't ever specify a toxin. Um, starving yourself does not detoxify you. Um, the liver and the kidneys do that job for you. You don't have to do anything to them. They will do it all by themselves. All you have to do is to eat a regular, um, um, a regular diet that has uh, plenty of nutrients in it, and everything will take care of itself. Um, the scams, as um, Mark Grislip has, uh, uh, supplements, uh, complementary and alternative medicines and they're scams. So that's how it's just easier for here. Um, it's it generally, I think that it's a result of the chemo, chemophobic fallacy. People don't really understand chemicals. They say, oh, something is made with a chemical. That means by definition it's bad. Well, everything in life is chemicals. These are the chemicals in a banana. And it's the most delicious and wholesome of all foods, right? Ask the doctor. So um, water, sucre, uh, let's see here, glucose, fructose, maltose, sucrose, um, fiber, I like when you get down into the uh, amino acids, glutamic acid, lysine, phenylalanine, threonine, isoleucine, blah, 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 linoleic acid, all these other things that sound, sound sciencey and sound scary, but, but they're actually, this is what we need. Okay, so detoxing. A detox program can help the body's natural cleansing process by resting the organs through fasting, um, uh, stimulating the liver to drive toxins from the body, uh, promoting elimination through the intestines, kidney, and skin. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, improving circulation of the blood and refueling the body with healthy nutrients. Well, all of these happen whether you want to or not. Right? The livers and the kidneys work just fine without you messing with them. And you're going to eat because you're hungry. Um, now, number one, though, 
that's kind of the opposite of two, three, and five, right? Resting the organs and eating a healthy diet are different things. Those, you can't do both at the same time. And if you don't use the organs, they'll atrophy, and they won't, they won't work when you need them to. Um, during toxic exposures, um, the uh, propylene glycol poisoning, Tylenol toxicity, you may need an antidote to the high concentrations, but, but um, you're still using the liver to, um, to metabolize the, even those toxins. So, because um, what it does is the, the medicine that we give to help that actually replenishes the liver's enzymes to help metabolize the acetaminophen and such. I actually had to do that to a patient last week. Um, so um, the rest, uh, the not eating does rest the intestine in a sense. So like if you've got gastroenteritis where everything's kind of hyperactive, you've got a lot of diarrhea, resting it by just giving it kind of a clear liquid actually can help. Um, but the organs evolved to work. That is their job. The liver does that we already talked about that. It's, it eliminates the toxins automatically. The intestines and the kidney eliminate automatically. And, um, oh, if you stimulate the... Uh, the intestines with laxatives or, laxatives or enemas, they may actually stop working because now they haven't had to work. You've done the job for them. So why would they bother working if you're going to do the job for them? Okay, so... Uh, oh, promoting the elimination of the toxins. Um, the, the, to the detectable toxins doesn't necessarily mean they've been eliminated. You know, it, it's, it's a strange kind of thing that they've got going on. They First of all, they assume that if there are toxins present in, in a system, that doesn't necessarily mean that those toxins are the cause of any particular thing. It's, a fa it's one of the fall many fallacies that they make. Um, they're improving the circulation of the blood by taking out the toxins. Well, the heart does that. You don't have to take out the toxins. And, and fasting is the opposite of the last thing that I said. So... Okay, so, I mean, who would, look at this. This is horrible. Why, why would anybody not want to do these things that they're charging you money to do? But this is, this is the, this is the um, false analogy. They keep talking about factory and polluting the environment, things like that. This is just one of the examples. And it's all bullshit. It's just all complete bullshit. Um, okay, so these are the assumptions, that there, our bodies are full of these toxins, um, that the toxins cause the illness, and that this particular thing removes the toxins. But is this really true? I mean, how do you know? They can't ever answer that question. What kind of toxins? How do you measure them? They can't answer these things. And then the toxins cause the illness. Well, how? What's the mechanism? What illness? Um, even if a substance is present, is that causing the symptoms? Um, is it a dose-dependent relationship like we would expect in medicine? And this particular thing they're trying to sell you removes the toxins. And then you got to ask, well, how? What's the mechanism? How do you measure the result of the removal? So, and they, they again, can't ever seem to answer those questions. Um, cleanse is another catch word that they use a lot. Um, and it kind of sounds sciencey, right? You want to cleanse things. Um, but the livers and the kidneys are self-cleaning. They take care of themselves. Um, so are the colons. Leave them alone. Um, now, they have other sciencey sounding words that they'll use. Purify, cleanse the toxins, support organ function, natural, which we've already covered. Arsenic is natural. Poison ivy is natural. That doesn't make them safe. Um, and organic. Oh, that drives me crazy. <laughs> but um, they all are meaningless terms. Um, the um, colon has a job to do, so leave it alone. You've got to have those bacterial organisms in there that make the, the vitamin K that help your blood clot. You need this whole biome that's, that's already there. If you start messing with it by adding things, you're really going to have some problems. Oh, this is one of my favorites. I love this one. Okay, so one of the claims that they make is that they can detoxify your body through um, um, these foot baths. I love these. You heard that one, right? You love these. Okay, so you're supposed to place your feet in warm water, and then they add these uh, 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 solution, you know, like it's a lovely smelling, whatever, and then they have these electrodes that go in the water, and that draws the toxins out of your body, right? Um, aqua Chi, ionic detoxification, bionic hydrotherapy. Ooh, that was in the body. Yuck, it's disgusting. Yeah, no, it wasn't. Uh, any of you remember physics um, or Chem like high school. I mean, like we did this kind of thing in high school. Um, this was not in the body. The skin is mostly impermeable. Otherwise, it wouldn't be skin, right? That's the point 
of having skin. And it's difficult to get medicines through skin. You can do it, but it's hard to do. Um, electric current doesn't know what's good and what's bad. It doesn't know. And the color in the water is from the electrodes during the electrolysis. So, and there's the simple setup there, if you want to look at it. Okay, this is just stupid, really. You put sticky pads on your feet and you peel off the dead skin and the dirt and it's supposed to detoxify. No, your feet are a little bit cleaner maybe, I'll give you that. So, that's gross. Okay, but I feel better when I detox. Well, most illnesses are self-limiting. Um, they have a waxing and waning course. They get better, they get worse. Um, when you are feeling at your worst, you're likely to seek treatment of some kind. And then when you get better, you credit the treatment when it may not have had anything to do with it. Um, chronic conditions get better on their own. Um, you eventually regress to the mean. So like if you have a really bad day and you have a good day, you know, there's a mean somewhere in there. And so eventually you're going to be the other again. Um, a confirmation bias, all the usual fallacies show up here. The post hoc, hic, ergo propter hoc. Who knows what that is? Remember? Yeah, she's a ringer, so <laughs> after this, therefore, because of it. That, to that point, if you take a thing when you're feeling your worst, and then you get better, you credit the thing. I can't tell you how many times I've seen patients will go through like chemotherapy for their cancer, but they're also doing whatever comp, um, scam therapy, the, the uh, you know, herbal or you know, whatever, in addition to that, and, and they get better, okay, if they get better. Now they're crediting the herbal thing, even though it was the chemo that really did it. Um, also, things get misdiagnosed. I mean, we're, we're human, we make mistakes. Um, we can, uh, and, and disease processes are all not always black and white. It is not always clear what a person has. Um, sometimes it's the different kind of tumor, like we were talking a little earlier about Steve Jobs' pancreatic cancer. Most pancreatic cancers are, are um, horrible and untreatable, but there are a few that are treatable if you catch them early enough. And so if you get misdiagnosed um, and you get treated for the one kind that is treatable and then you say oh this cured my pancreatic cancer well you know that was just we made a mistake so um I like Peter Pressman's comment. These detox programs amount to a large quantity of excrement, both literally and figuratively. And this is what it reliably does. It empties your wallet. Yeah. So, but why do people Sorry? It cleanses your wallet. That's right. It relieves you of the burden of all this, this evil cash. Okay, so, but why do people believe these things? Um, part of it, uh, well, I mean, you know, these are all the usual suspects, right? The confirmation bias, the cognitive biases, which we all have. And if we knew what they were, we wouldn't have, I mean, we, we can't see our own biases, and that's a problem. Um, placebo effects. Um, sometimes there is a kernel of truth um, in them. And um, one of the problems that we do see is that people are taught what to think and not being taught how to think. So that when new, new technologies, new understandings do come through and they're still sticking with this old one, this old paradigm, and they don't realize that you have to actually now incorporate this other th paradigm. If they can't think, if they don't know how to think about it, then they're going to make, start making uh, judgment errors. And Ben, actually, I stole this from your Facebook page, sorry. Um, humans, <laughs> you said I could, so. Humans have a fascinating and powerful psychological tendency to believe whatever they first hear about something. Once it's entrenched, it's very difficult to show them they're wrong, even with clear, undisputable evidence. So that was Ben's Facebook page from a few, uh, I guess it was last, uh, earlier in this year. Um, so here's some more places if you want to get some more information on the topic. Um, these are all excellent, and there are dozens more that I never managed, to, I was able to put on here. Um, actually, one of them that is not on here that I really like is called, if you're, especially if you're interested in medical myths and alternative medicine, is trick or treatment. It's Edgar er, Ernst, right? Yeah, Ernst. Um, he was a homeopath and has studied ex complementary medicine extensively and is very clear eyed about it. It's a fantastic book. I loved that one. I loaned it to a friend of mine. I haven't seen it again. I have to get another copy. So I'm going to end with one of my favorite stories. Okay, who has seen this in the grocery store? Y'all seen Oscillococcinium? Oh, okay, so this is actually kind of brilliant. Um, back in the uh, Spanish flu era, era, about 19, you know, 17, 18 kind of time frame, people were dropping like flies. I mean, this was this horrible pandemic. And um, there was a doctor named uh, Joseph Roy who um, was trying to figure out the cause and the treatment for Spanish flu. 
And um, he was looking um, at blood from patients who had this horrible strain of the, of the flu under a microscope. And um, he saw these little wiggly round things, okay? Um, and he, like he's looking in there, he sees these wiggly round things. That's what oscillococcinia means. Oscillo means wiggly, and then coccinium is round things, right? Wiggly round things. They just make it all Latin and sound sciencey. So um, he also claims to have seen the same little wiggly round things in cancer sufferers. And he proposed this homeopathic um, preparation. Now, who knows what homeopathy is? Well, okay, all right, okay, besides from that, <laughs> aside from bullshit, what? <laughs> so, um, it, it's water, exactly. So what they do, what they do, the postulate, I've got a whole lecture on this too, but um, the, the Cliff Notes version is that um, the um, like, crea uh, like treats like. So for example, if you have, um, um, say, a runny nose or something, they'll treat it with onion juice, but they don't actually treat with the onion juice. They put a drop of onion juice in water, in like a, I don't know, some fixed amount of water, a liter or a gallon or something like that, and they shake it up in a magical way. And then they pour that out. And then they put more water in there without putting any more onion juice in there. They just put the water in there. They shake it up another magical way, and they toss that out. And they do that 30 times, sometimes 200 times. It kind of depends on how strong they want their solution, because the weaker it is, the stronger it is. Does that make sense <laughs> from our understanding of science? No, of course it doesn't make sense, but whatever. So, so they claim that water has memory. And so this contact with the onion juice has somehow made this water remember the onion juice. It has fond memories of the onion juice. <laughs> and then it tells its buddies about the fond memories of the onion juice. And then it, you put more water in there, and it then they tells it, and it gets stronger and stronger as these fond memories get stronger and stronger. So... Um, to the point where there is no actual onion juice left in this preparation. It can't be, there can't be, there are not enough atoms in this at all to have even one atom of the onion juice. So um, then they take that, a drop of that and they put it on a sugar pill and that's what you take. I'm not kidding. People pay big bucks for this, look. $21, it's $20.99 for this. I took this picture last, uh, last winter at Whole Foods. $21. Um, so, uh, when Dr. Roy, or when Joseph Roy um, was looking at his little wiggly round things on the microscope, he discovered that the little wiggly round things were most commonly present on preparations of duck, liver, and heart. So, he decided, well, since there are more little wiggly round things on the duck and, and uh, uh, heart and liver slides, they must be there for the, for the um, and, and they're there for the flu, then this must treat the flu because he believed that homeopathy was a thing. So um, he would give them and the patients would sometimes get better. Well, what do we say about disease progression earlier? Sometimes people do get better. Not everyone who got the flu died from it. And if you give people who are sick water, they get better, right? If you don't give them something that's going to actually harm them, they sometimes get better. And water is better than nothing in, the, in that sense because you're hydrating a person with a fever, which we talked about earlier was also a good thing. So anyway, he did get some people who, and now this thing has taken off. There's a single company in France, and it takes one Muscovy duck to supply the entire planet with oxalococcinium <laughs> for like a year or something crazy like that. The universe, right. Okay, so when you look on this label, I don't think I have a picture of it on there. I can't quite see. I didn't take a picture of that. But if you happen in Whole Foods and you see this on the shelf, pick it up and look at it. And I actually had this discussion with one of my patients who brought this stuff in. She'd been taking it for the flu. And it's in Latin. It says uh, anas and, um, and they're just duck. And it had uh, cordis, which is heart, and hepatis, which is liver. If you look at it, you will see it says, basically in Latin, it says duck, liver, and heart. So, yeah, don't take this stuff. Don't give them your money, <laughs> please. And write letters to companies who like Walgreens, CVS, Whole Foods, people who put this kind of thing on the shelves next to real medicine. It infuriates me. So I want you to be my allies in this. Please, please, please write them letters so they won't carry it anymore and, and make other people waste their money and, and such. So anyway, if you need additional references, uh, these are good original sources and um, anybody in this room can give you some more information. Any questions?
Hi, Barbara Dresser. Hi. Um, I, I don't know how on topic this is, but I was wondering if you could possibly tell us why the flu shot hurts so much more than all the other shots do. <laughs> honestly, I don't know. I mean, it could be psychological, right? <laughs> no, I, I honestly, I don't know that. And um, that has not been my experience. In my experience, the tetanus shot is the most painful. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I, I don't know. I mean, it may just be, you know, the reaction to the, to the um, um, virus, that, the killed virus that you're taking. Don't know. Sorry. I'll have to get back to you on that one. So uh, I think Silent Spring, uh, I don't know if it started it or not, but it, it generated a fear over, a legitimate, uh, over the legitimate buildup of, I don't want to say toxins, but uh, lethal DDT, substances. you're talking about the DDT? Yeah, yeah DDT, yeah. exactly. So, um, and that's a real thing. So, uh, how do you how do you do, uh, describe to somebody or explain to somebody the difference between buildup of DDT in you and buildup of uh, I don't know whatever the mystery d Imaginary toxin of the toxins. week? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good question, and I, I I remember seeing some information. Ben, you might actually have some more information on this than I have. I had seen some uh, information lately that DDT may not have been as bad as we thought it was for humans. I mean, like it was bad for birds, but I don't know if it was so bad for us. Yeah, I, I understand that, that some, of the, some, of the, some of the original complaints about DDT were overstated. I mean, not, not again, bring it. Right. But, <laughs> some of the original complaints about it, it was with uh, Rachel Carr and, and right. Uh, were, were over Right. Yeah, that was my understanding too, although I don't have any specific sources. I'm so sorry, I don't have that information right off the top of my head. In case you couldn't hear, Ben, um, that uh, the original complaints about DDT um, were uh, probably overstated. Not, not, um, um, not 100% like false, but, but it may have just been a little overstated. So, And we, we'll, we'll, you know, I'm sure there are other, more, I think, Ske didn't, didn't Skeptoid do a thing on that? I think I remember seeing that, and I think the SGU did a podcast on it, too. I think they, Stephen Novella mentioned it. <coughs> that your, your mother and sisters loved it, and they run ar ran around in the spray? Oh, okay. Well, that explains a lot. So. <laughs> so. All right. My question was one I think everyone's heard before, What's and that? it's that if you fall asleep with a concussion, you might never wake up. Oh, oh, okay, now you're getting into stuff that movies do, and it just drives me bananas. Yeah, um, well, <sighs> yes and no. Um, the problem is that many head injuries do induce sleepiness. Um, uh, one of the most um, uh, ominous and um, horrible of them is an epidural hematoma. Um, you get a blow to the skull, okay, especially right here over the temporal bone, and there's an artery runs in the inside of the skull called the middle meningeal artery. I'm just showing off now. Anyway, so <laughs> so anyway, and it can and it causes an epidural hematoma. It's an expanding arterial bleed. You'll get it uh, classically. You'll get an initial loss of consciousness, a return to normal. Although the studies are showing it's not really all the way back to normal, and then later they go to sleep and they don't wake up because they've had their brain herniation. Natasha Richardson, this is what happened to her. Um, although it's unclear whether she actually lost consciousness or not. So um, the um, going to sleep part, um, after you've been evaluated, right, once, you, once you've seen a physician and had your CAT scan or whatever, um, you can go to sleep. We, we do that all the time. In fact, before we had CAT scans, we would, have, we would keep people in the emergency department. We'd let them go to sleep or, you know, or admit them to the hospital. And we'd let them go to sleep, but we'd wake them. If they can't wake up, now we got big problems, right? But um, but yes, you can go to sleep. You just have to be wakened frequently. So, but I just was, I just finished watching Dexter. Has anybody yes. who loves Dexter, right? I love Dexter. Anyway, well, okay, got a, like, kind of more of a chore towards the end. But but that whole episode when he had a concussion, and the doctor was wrong. I'm yelling at the thing. No, that's not how it works. So I I, I just I can't watch medical things for that reason a lot of times. So, so I can give him some license, you know. But I. But when it's actually, frankly, wrong medical information, I actually kind of get a little upset. So anyway, did that answer your question? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, good. Yes, sir. What's next? Um, yes. Um, I'm wondering, are natural organic foods actually healthier than processed foods? No. Well, okay. Let me rephrase that. <laughs> Is a salad better for you than a loaf of bread? Or I don't know what your definition of processed um, foods, because most foods are processed to some extent. Like processed food, I guess. I mean, like a Pop-Tart or like meat you would buy in a store? As okay, well, I had Pop-Tarts for breakfast, so I might be a little bit biased, but um, is it, you have to define what you mean by better. Is it part of this nutritious breakfast? 
can be. I guess like healthier in terms of just overall health. Um, you know, food you'll buy in a farmer's market as opposed to like something like Kroger or Walmart. Basically. Um, generally, no, they're not any different. So, like, if you take an organic carrot and a regular carrot, because we really have to compare carrots to carrots here, or <laughs> right? <laughs> so, or you know, a organic apple to a non-organic apple. Uh, no, there's no difference between them, in general. Thank so. you. You're welcome. Going with oh, his price. Price is a big difference. Going with his Oh, my gosh. So, yeah, cheese? huge difference. Processed price. cheese versus, not, like, regular cheese? A pasteurized processed cheese food yeah, versus it, a... It's kind of with his question. That's why I jumped out. Well, you probably... I mean, as much as I love cheese, I have to say, you probably ought to eat both in mo either one in moderation. Oh, my... Fa oh, you just kind of brought up. I'm sorry. sorry. One of them, there's a, there's a meme that go, that went around the Internet. Uh, it goes around periodically, and it was like, ooh, uh, cheese whiz is only one molecule away from plastic or some crazy thing like that. <laughs> That's such bullshit. It's not even wrong. It's so wrong. You know, that thing, yeah, that's not true. So, <laughs> but I like regular cheese. I can't stand the taste of cheese whiz, but that's just me. So, if you could speak to the theory about um, if, you ha if you eat honey that's unfiltered and still has the pollen in it and it's local honey, it's supposed to somehow help with um, allergies to pollen. Yeah, I've heard that one. Um, uh, the um, what's that? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I guess there is some plausibility. I haven't looked into that in, in explicit detail. I'm sorry, I can't answer it so explicitly. I'm going to look it up after this. But, but um, I, 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 I seem to remember hearing something about that that was rubbish. So I can't, I can't answer that specific question. I'm sorry. There is part of the immune system lining the digestive tract. And one of the ways that people did um, do allergy tolerances, the um, immune system is very complex. I don't want to get into a lot of detail on it. But um, <clears throat> the first time you're exposed to a thing, your body makes a particular kind of antibody called IgM. And they're huge molecules. And um, they're pretty easily detected in the blood in most cases. Once that first exposure is there, I'm kind of reaching back into medical school <laughs> um, immunology, but once that's, that's done, then your, your gene kind of switches to the next in the line because it assembles the, the uh, antibodies. And then um, the, I can't remember what order they're in, but there's an IgA, IgE, IgG, and probably there are people in here that remember a lot more than I do about it. But, which IgE is second? G is second? Okay, well, if they, I think the point of the allergy shots and the exposure to the allergens is to try to skip you over from the IgE, which is an actual um, allergy in, uh, marker, to the IgG, which is the antibody that helps with immunity. So I, I'm going to, that's about the extent of my memory of, because uh, I'm emergency, like we don't do that stuff. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, bleeding thing, we put a thing on it. But um, anyway, so you're dying, I do chest compressions, I don't remember the IgE, IgA. Um, I do remember a lot of them, but, um, and, and the digestive tract does have a lot of immunologic um, um, cells, and I suppose there's some plausibility, but I'm going to have to look into the specific, the specifics on that. But thanks you for the question. That's a good question. Hey, Steve. Hey, Dr. Angie. Hey, uh, two questions real quick. Uh, is melatonin for, like, helping sleep, is that falling to the woo, or is yes. that actually... Okay. Next question. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. The, um, are there <laughs> alternative uh, antibiotics f that for people who have the, the problem with the egg... Alternate, oh, you mean vaccines? Yeah, Alternative sorry, vaccines. vaccines yes. Yeah, they make a lot of them without egg. Okay, so you can get yeah. egg free versions of most of the vaccines. I'm not clear if it's every one of them, but in most of them you can. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. That was easy. Next. <laughs> I love them when they're easy. That's right. I hope this one will be easy too. It's on the vaccine. I know we've talked a lot about vaccination of children. I've heard that in some cases adults might need boosters at some point. Yes. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yes, you need boosters. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you want more information? Okay. All right. Um, we are discovering that the pertussis uh, immunity does wane. That's pertussis causes whooping cough. And we humans are the only reservoirs of pertussis. So, yes, please get vaccinated. Um, I don't know if they're not. Are they doing a vaccination clinic here? Not this year. Okay. We've been... Oh, that's a big old bummer. Okay, well, Dragon Con was actually really good at, we had vaccine clinics here. Now, I wish I could claim responsibility for that brilliant stroke of genius, but I can't. Um, at Maria Walters and, and them, I really wish that, that I had been in with them because that was just a brilliant work of, of, of you know, civic 
duty and they did, I just I'm so proud of them for doing that um, <clears throat> and they had vaccination clinics here for years and um, they vaccinated like 2200 people in one year and it, it was amazing they did such a great job I mean this is a great place to do that kind of thing now I know at my medical conferences they're doing boosters um, like the um, American College of Emergency Physician has a wellness booth and they do boosters so yes please see your doctor about getting boosters Yes. Hi. So um, I think as a result of the poor sex education in our country that I think sexual health myths are one of like the most prolific, at least in my experience. Mm -hmm. And I would, if you know. What do you want to know, honey? I'll help you. <laughs> no, I, I, <laughs> Whatever I'm probably you need the most informed person of my age group uh -huh. in Georgia, at least. And, um, <laughs> but uh, if you have any like cool their facts or anything you want to talk about that'd be <laughs> awesome but you want cool uh, sex facts <laughs> <laughs> well i mean like just uh, me too somebody give me some cool sex facts no no <laughs> well i mean like i heard somebody at my school say like oh chlamydia is like the chicken pox you just get it once and then you have it for the rest of your life i'm like that's no, not no, true. no 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 that's herpes <laughs> <laughs> And, um, <laughs> That's not true. You can get chlamydia over and over again. Anyway, uh, to bring it back to more relevant, um, I my mom didn't let me get the HPV vaccine because mm. it was like right after it came out, oh, that's and a shame. she didn't know what like the long term effects were. Like if so, like what is the testing process for vaccines? Like is it like do they have like long term? Oh testing yes, things? they yeah. do. They really do. Um, um, actually, I'm glad you brought out HPV vaccine. That was developed at Medical College of Georgia, where I went to medical school. So I wasn't personally involved. I wish I could claim credit, but no, I didn't have anything to do with it. But um, the HPV vaccine is the only thing that we do that prevents cancer. It is a vaccine against cancer. Like, why wouldn't everybody do that, right? Well, Barbara Bachman, I think it was, got some crackpot, came up to her and said that her daughter had been harmed by that vaccine. And then she, who has this gigantic megaphone. Michelle Bachman. Oh, Michelle Bachman. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I miss Oh, yeah, the other Bachman, yeah. So the less crazy one, right? <laughs> so anyway, well, you know, that's negotiable. But anyway, um, I didn't mean to do that. But my point is that this, this politician who doesn't have science background and uh, who then takes this information that she thinks is valid from a person who has no actual medical knowledge and her only evidence is that I think this is true. It wasn't actually true. So now Bachman comes out and she says this thing on national television and now everyone is terrified of the HPV vaccine. Or not everyone, but many people became terrified of it. And what a huge disservice to our young women. I mean, in particular, males can get it too. Um, there are some specific recommendations about that from the CDC. But, but um, yes, I endorse it. And I would have my children get it. Uh, I just I want to children. say that... Uh, geeky myself uh I actually, no really at dragon con it's just the two of us i think um i, I <laughs> personally i think that we should encourage men to get the hpv vaccine more i agree because there isn't a like commercially available test for it like there is for women so like men can have it and have no idea and be spreading it to female partners without knowing but if they just get vaccinated initially then they don't have to worry about it at all i agree you can yeah. wear a condom and help prevent that too uh condoms don't prevent it's skin to skin contact it, last it, i it, checked condoms it, prevented some it, skin to skin it reduces, contact it reduces it but it doesn't it yeah it doesn't make it, it go all the way away that's absolutely true right okay. so you're absolutely right about that yeah next hi. hi i was wondering what causes the fear of needles like sharp objects what what causes what the fear of needles they're sharp objects they hurt <laughs> okay, what's not so scary about that <laughs> i'm i'm deathly afraid of them but they don't hurt me like is it just the psychological thing oh no i'm getting something stabbed in my skin probably okay you just gonna have to deal with that, honey. Sorry. <laughs> no, really. It's I, I understand. I see. I hear that all the time, actually, from my patients. Evolution. Yeah, that would actually be um, that would actually probably be the best answer. I hear it all the time. It's funny. I hear patients. They are tattooed head to toe. They have 17 piercings, and they are terrified of needles. I said, you don't get to use that excuse. I mean, I'll give you credit for two piercings. Like you can have one. Oh crap! I got to do the other one. Oh my gosh! I'm terrified. Or one tattoo. But, and then after that, I'm just gonna make fun of you. So, anyway, Hi. maybe that's not very charitable. I shouldn't say that out loud. <laughs> I don't really. Yes, sir. I'd like to know what you know about a couple of food related buzzwords uh, antioxidants uh. and superfood. Uh, I actually have a whole lecture on that. Um, maybe Derek will let me give it next year. Um, 
the um, the the word superfood is just made up. That was that's a marketing term that um, people have kind of latched onto. Um, there's nothing magical about those foods. Um, they they are sometimes you like them. They're delicious. Eat them if you like them. Whatever, um, but they're not magic. And um, they have you can often get just as much nutrition, if not more, from other sources. So um, generally the things that they push as superfoods are generally pretty good for you. They generally have a decent amount of um, calories to um, fats and, and volume, which is good. And, you know, generally you should be eating a low, um, a, um, a lowish calorie diet and, you know, healthy foods, you know, a wide variety, and your body kind of takes care of itself. Um, as far as antioxidants go, you need a certain amount of antioxidation to go on in your, in your bloodstream, in your, in your body because otherwise um, you, the um, studies do show that you can increase your risk for cancers by doing that. So, um, Generally speaking, though, those are marketing terms and they don't, I mean, antioxidant really is a term in medicine, but they misuse it in, in marketing tools, surprise, surprise. So. I don't know how many people have heard this one, but uh, I think I read this on the internet that it's it's not good. <laughs> no, yeah. no so nobody that's why can be I wrong on the internet. This. So I've heard that sleeping under a ceiling fan can can be bad somehow for like. Why? Because it's gonna fall on you. And no, like for your ears or something like that. And do what? I don't know. Some, like sleeping right directly under a ceiling fan can be bad for your ears or something. Can hurt, be bad for your ears? Yeah, I mean I. Yeah, that's silly. Yeah, I read this somewhere. No. No. I can't imagine. I mean, that's just ridiculous. No. Okay. <laughs> Damn internet. <laughs> a Skeptoid podcast on yeah I know I, I like Skeptoid but I haven't listened to I haven't heard that particular one. Does Brian does Brian back me up on that? Yes. Okay, good. Hi, hey. Dr. Angie. Hi, Mark. Um, my mother got the shingles when she was in her late 80s, and it was the most painful, oh, yeah, horrific um, thing to witness. It mm -hmm. drove her crazy, actually. She ended up in a mental institution because of the intense pain. Oh, my heavens. Um, but um, I wanted to ask you, what is the age? Oh, by the way, I kind of fault the assisted care facility for not offering um, the shingles vaccine to anyone over a certain age. And that's my question. Is what age is it that um, we should be concerned about getting a shingles vaccine? I, after the, what happened to my mother, I immediately got one, mm -hmm. but I didn't know if I was too early or too late or what, yeah. you know, whatever. Well, um, that's a good question. Um, the CDC, I think it's 65 is when they recommend the shingles vaccine. Um, shingles is actually the chicken pox, uh, herpes zoster. It's uh, the same virus. And um, as most of you who know about herpes know, herpes is like luggage. You never get rid of it, right? So um, the herpes zoster um, will periodically recur along a particular strip of skin. Since you don't ever get rid of it, it lives in the, in the um, uh, uh, nerves around the spinal cord. And then it'll sometimes come out along a particular nerve root and you'll get a strip of rash on the torso or on the face commonly is where older people get it. And um, it's extremely painful, um, and we, we've got antivirals that will help, but they don't make it go all the way away. The shingles vaccine actually decreases the risk of that occurring. It doesn't make it completely not come at all. You still, you still can get it. Um, but usually when you do get it, it's not quite as bad. It doesn't last quite as long. It doesn't hurt quite as much. So that's generally the, the gist of getting the vaccine. Um, usually around 65 is when they recommend it because much earlier and it doesn't do as much good. You still have some immunity from when we had chicken pox as kids or in some of the older, ki uh, older I'm sorry, younger people than me <laughs> who were, came along after the vaccine for chicken pox came along um, who have been vaccinated but their vaccine um, immunity may be waning. So um, I, I, I think the CB CDC recommendation is at 65. So yes. I've got a, a question about cancer screening. Uh, with so many cancers out these days, uh, for um, yeah, they're just coming your, out with them all the time, yeah, aren't they? Well, it's crazy for like every organ almost. Um, <laughs> what's the imagine? What's the most efficient screening process? I mean, uh, I mean, you go in for a yearly physical, sure, but will like basic blood tests um, cue doctors into abnormalities with the, that are potentially cancerous in? certain organs or? Well, that's kind of a big question. It, it depends on which organ you're interested in. I mean, is it skin cancer? You look in the mirror. 
Well, yeah, I mean, like, uh, like pancreatic, for example, something internal that you can't really just see normally. Well, screening tests for things like pancreatic cancer, you don't, it's just pointless. It's not a common cancer. Um, it's a horrible cancer, but it's not common. Um, the uh, way to screen for it actually may pose higher risk for developing thyroid cancer because the way you'd look would be with like a CAT scan to look for masses. And um, that actually has its own radiation risk associated with it. There are a certain number of CAT scans you should have in your lifetime. Or you should, let me rephrase that. <laughs> there, you're limited to a certain number of CAT scans in your lifetime before you start really increasing your risk for cancer, for new cancers because of the radiation. So um, that one you actually might have to wait till you have symptoms. But um, <clears throat> But the, um, um, it depends on the kind of cancer you mean. Testicular cancer, do self-exams. If you feel a lump, go see the doctor. Um, breast exam, same thing. If you feel a lump, go see the doctor. Um, I, I, I can't address the specific uh, 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 recommendations because I'm not that specialty, and they do change their recommendations based on new evidence and uh, uh, balancing risk versus cost. And so um, if people who do not have first-degree relatives um, uh, with a particular kind of cancer, most of the time don't get regular screening for it. Um, if you have a first degree relative with a pancreatic cancer or a testicular cancer or breast cancer or brain, you know, any other of the cancers, then the rules are a little bit different, so I really can't address those. But, um, but really, go see your doctor. Thank you. So. Well, while Mark, these lights are really bright. <laughs> yeah, they're bright. Very up here annoying. Too. Very annoying. Uh, you haven't said anything about vitamins. Um, oh, yeah. I, I know. And I just want to ask about one in particular because I have a bunch of them in my refrigerator. Um, <laughs> fish oil. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, actually, again, I have a whole talk on this. Um, but um, um, when it comes to vitamins and um, the herbal supplements. Now, some of those are real medicines. Don't fool yourself. I mean, if somebody has an iron deficiency, iron is now a medicine for them. So, but taking it routinely, if you're not already actively anemic or iron deficient or whatever, it's really not going to do you much good and it may actually do you some harm. You can get iron toxicity. Um, that's one of the toxins that we actually can fix, uh, toxicities we can fix. Um, <clears throat> Um, as, uh, as far as fish oil goes, I'm going to have to defer to some of the cardiothoracic, I mean the cardio literature on that. Um, I don't think there's a huge evidence that, I mean, like, I don't think that the evidence held up. I mean, I think there's some weak evidence for it. Um, the only thing that we know for sure makes a huge impact on health is folic acid in reproductive age women, routinely. Take it, take it, take it. It reduces neural tube defects, birth defects by a huge, like ridiculous number. So every female of reproductive age, like your daughters, when they hit their period time, give them folic acid and make them take it every day for the rest of their reproductive years. So, yes, sir. Hello. Hi. I very much enjoy the uh, panel. Thank so you. To speak. Panel. Uh, panel. <laughs> <laughs> Me, myself, and I. <laughs> I. I get used to saying panel every time. Yes. Uh, my doctor just increased my recommended dosage of vitamin D from 1,000 to 2,000 units. What is the deal with vitamin D? Um, that is a good question. I, I'm hearing a lot of people now say that they're vitamin D deficient. And um, I'm not really clear on if that's because the FDA redefined <laughs> the, um, the actual requirement in the day or if there was some other thing going on. Sunscreen. Sorry? Sunscreen. Sunscreen. Well, I mean, I've heard that implicated. I have heard that implicated. Um, so, yes, people are, are uh, the, the, the postulation is that people are, are vitamin D deficient because most of us are using sunscreen now that we didn't used to use. Um, you don't really need that much sunshine, though, to get an adequate amount of vitamin D. Um, so, um, I'm going to, again, I'm going to have to defer to your doctor on this. Um, I don't have any specific, um, um, other than that, I don't have any more specific information on that. So, so if I'm low on vitamin D, my absorption of calcium will change? Oh, yeah. Are you talking about the actual chemical what, what, yeah, why bother? stuff? Oh, yeah. Vitamin D is one of the things that's required for absorption of calcium and okay. strong bones. And so, and so that's why they want to maintain your levels of vitamin D. Especially as we get older, we do lose bone mass. And so we want to maximize it as long as possible because we want as few hip fractures as possible, especially in older folks. Ribs, ribs break and you know, limbs break and shoulders break and stuff like that. And we want to prolong that functional time as long as we can. Thank you. So, all right. Quick question on the sunlight. How much sunlight or how many minutes of sunlight or gives you your daily? Go I think it's like 20 minutes a week or something. It's like really not that much. Yeah, it's not that much. Oh, are we done? We're done. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you, everybody. That was a great question. Thank you.